Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Eurofence Discovery Webinar for Japanese Safety Pharmacology Society. My name is David Wei. I will be serving as your moderator today. Today, we will be hearing a presentation from Mr. Brian Kosi, who will be speaking to us on integrated cardiac prorhythmic risk assessment under the SIPA initiative. Mr. Kosi is currently the scientific director of Ein Channel and the Custom Assay Services of Eurofence Discovery, where his main job responsibility is project and scientific management of Ein Channel, ME, and drug discovery projects. He works with clients that range from small startups to large pharma and academic institutions. Previous to Eurofence, he was a lab manager in the Small Molecule Discovery Research Group at Boringer Ingerham in Richfield, Connecticut. His group developed and conducted in vitro biochemical and cell-based assays to enable safety and toxicology profiling and characterization of normal small molecules drug candidates. Prior to joining BI in 2010, Mr. Kosi held research scientist positions from 1999 to 2010 at Pfizer, Broughton, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and St. Louis, Missouri. Mr. Kosi's training and expertise includes electrophysiology, cardiovascular physiology, and ex vivo and in vivo animal models. Now, moving along to our session, please welcome Mr. Kosi. Thank you, David, for the warm introduction. Um, I feel um, uh, very special to be able to present to you today not only an overview of SIPA, but also how Eurofins has contributed to the SIPA initiative and how we can support your drug discovery programs. Um, today I'd like to go over um, several things, um, and this is in the outline slide, that um, give maybe just a general overview of cardiac and ion channel um, physiology. Um, also, why is HERG important and why do we test it and how is that part of the guidelines today? But more importantly, how we're going to assess cardiac safety in the future. And this will include the SIPA paradigm and how that will contribute to hopefully developing safer and more uh, uh, drugs without any liabilities. Um, also, I wanted to go over what the, um, how Eurofins has contributed to the SIPA initiative, not only from a data perspective, but also helping develop the strategy. Um, I'll also go over some data that we have tested for the SIPA paradigm um, using the QPatch platform and how we've contributed data to that, that initiative and how that will interact with um, potentially guidelines in the future. And then also I will go into um, how we can assess it in more of an integrative assessment so we can look at individual ion channels, but how can we look at um, when we see inhibition in certain targets, how can we get an overall assessment of what our potential risk factors are in terms of proarrhythmia. And then in summary, I will go over some of the services that Eurofins offers and how we can help your drug discovery programs. So I thought I'd start off with, obviously, we're talking about um, HERG and potentially um, QT issues, but really, what, what does this all mean? Obviously, the heart is a, an essential organ in our system, and it basically keeps us alive. And there's some metrics on this slide of how many times a, a heart beats in a given day, year, and normal lifespan. And this is a highly coordinated electrical activity that keeps the heart pumping in an efficient uh, manner to deliver blood throughout the body. So as you can imagine, if there's any interruption in that electrical activity, the heart will not pump in a coordinated manner, which also ultimately will result in potentially tissue damage or in, in the worst case, death. So we want to try to avoid any potential effects that could happen to the electrical activity of this heart, especially when we're giving a, a pharmaceutical to a, uh, to a patient. So why is the HERG channel important? Um, so obviously, the HERC channel is a, a very large channel that is very promiscuous in terms of compounds binding. And we've been testing HERC for over 20 years now um, to hopefully de-risk compounds to not potentially have an effect that would cause a, an arrhythmia. Um, so if we block the HERC channel, what, what really happens? 
Well, that can augment the action potential, which would could, could affect repolarization of that action potential and ultimately translate into a QT interval prolongation, which could potentially set the stage up for having a cardiac event. And obviously, we want to not have that attribute in any of our pharmaceuticals so that our patients can take compounds and that they, they potentially would be safe um, safe drugs that would not cause any um, side effects in terms of having a potential to impact the heart. So why did this come about? So basically in the late 90s, there were several compounds uh, that were on the market that ultimately caused QT prolongation and caused cardiac events. So that's when it was more scrutinized that historically we hadn't really tested for HERG specifically um, and, but we were able to link basically uh, HERG inhibition to QT prolongation. Um, so that set the stage for the FDA to say, you know, maybe we should start testing this or they ultimately recommended us to start testing HERG as potentially a surrogate to predict potential cardiac events. Um, and again, from this historic timeline, you can see several compounds that um, had this attribute that were ultimately pulled off the market. Um, however, um, just measuring QT itself and also looking at clinical trials, you have a very small patient population. So it wouldn't necessarily pick up these potential effects. And obviously these compounds were put on the market and seen, were deemed safe, at least from the initial clinical trials, and there, there were no issues. But when you went to a larger population, now all of a sudden we saw some potential problems and ultimately, in some cases, death. So now we needed to, to be able to test this in an efficient manner to be able to predict these potential um, cardiac events in, in, in an in vivo setting and ultimately would hopefully translate to the uh, in vivo setting as well. So again, we can test HERG, we can get an IC50, but what does that really mean? And it ultimately comes down to what dosage you're giving the patient and what the free drug uh, concentration is in the body. A HERG IC50 in itself doesn't really tell us whether or not a compound will be safe only at that given concentration, but how does that translate to when we're giving this compound to um, a patient and how does that ultimately uh, um, affect the potential safety margin. So again, we can look at a HERG IC50. We can also measure a free plasma concentration. Um, and from that, we can develop a safety ratio. And there was a, a publication by Redfern um, about 15 years ago that basically looked at a whole host of compounds that um, showed um, QT prolongation, but didn't necessarily show uh, uh, prorhythmia and basically what we found out was that if we anything below a 30 index and that is meaning a HERG IC50 versus free plasma concentration potentially you, you run a very large risk of having a cardiac event however if the ratio is greater than 100 um, that there has been no known compound that has shown any potential QT prolongation or cardiac event um, with that with that safety margin um, so we talk about HERG in terms of the action potential and that is potential effects on, on the, the prolongation of the action potential itself. However, there are other ion channels that also contribute to this action potential in terms of depolarization or repolarization. And specifically, calcium and sodium are also large players in, term, in determining the action potential shape. Um, and if, if, if we just look at HERG in its own isolated event, obviously we can see prolongation, but if we impact both sodium and calcium, that can also have some detrimental effects to the action potential as well. There are also other ion channels, um, such as ITO and IKS, that also contribute, that we also want to keep in mind when we're, we're assessing a compound's cardiac liability that could also play a role in potentially um, QT prolongation or other um, morphological changes to the ECG. So what is CIPA? <clears throat> so CIPA is basically, again, as I mentioned, HERG is the main um, FDA regulation currently to um, assess uh, the potential of causing arrhythmias. Um, however, there are other channels, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, that can play a role. So basically, a SIP initiative wants to look at a more robust assessment of a compound um, earlier on 
and ultimately develop some translation to be able to predict um, what we would see in the clinic. So how is that accomplished? Well, one, we can look at a multitude of cardiac ion channels in a panel in overexpressed cell lines and get the potential inhibition for each one of those channels. We can then take that data, put it in an in silico model, and ultimately come up with a potential um, action potential that would, would, would result from those particular inhibitions. However, that gives us uh, uh, basically a mathematical model on how we can see the action potential, but really ultimately we need to be able to translate that into some type of integrative assessment. Um, so by looking at iPS cells in um, a, a, a different models, we can also get an integrative assessment that hopefully will translate the um, overexpressed cell line, the, the um, assessments, also the in silico, but ultimately in a cell that, um, a cardiomyocyte, that potentially that we can get an overall effect. And hopefully that translation will um, correlate to what we would see in clinic when we, when we actually do QT assessments or uh, ECG assessments in, in the patient. So how did urofins contribute to um, both the, the HESI and also the SIPA paradigm? Uh, basically, um, the, the, the SIPA initiative was to look at a host of compounds that were selected by the consortium um, that had three basically buckets of um, risk factors from low, meet, intermediate, and high. And by looking at uh, 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 these different compounds, these different risk factors, by assessing multiple channels, looking at the in silico model and also looking at an integrated assessment that we could basically develop um, a translation for what we would expect to see in a novel compound in this in the same modality. So how this worked was basically the, the, there was one source for all these compounds and these compounds were shipped to multiple sites and, and urofins was one of them. And basically they developed standardized protocols, both from the solution standpoint and voltage protocols as well, that we would all run in the same modality. Um, we would collect the data. Now this was done on multiple different platforms. And then all that data would be um, consolidated to be able to look at to see if what the variability was from site to site and, and how that translation worked. So for urofins, the way that we assessed it was on the QPatch platform. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of uh, what this platform is and, and how we do recordings. Um, and it's an automated patch clap, um, platform. It has a 48 well capacity. Um, so you can think of it as a mini 48 well uh, manual patch uh, platform. It's very comparable to manual patch recordings. We've done a, a large assessment on looking at a multitude of compounds, both in manual patch and this platform, prior to doing um, work for the consortium. Um, so we have a lot of historic data showing the, 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 a very strong correlation to what we would see on the Q-patch versus manual patch. Um, all the dose responses are done in a single well, so we either run it in a three or five concentration um, modality. Um, it's a great tool, and we were actually in Eurofins, we run all of our voltage gated channels on this QPatch platform, um, but it can also be used for ligand gated as well. The other nice thing about the QPatch is it's all glass, so the compounds are made up in glass, and each one of the wells is glass as well. And you can also do multiple additions of compound, and it's actually a flow through system. So you can add compound to your well, to the cells pull that solution through and add it at multiple times or as many times as you would like. Um, so that allows to make sure that you have equilibrium of your compound in the well and the cells are exposed to the true concentration. So I'm going to go over just a little bit of the data um, that was generated from um, the Q-patch um, and just give you an idea of what we were seeing and how um, looking at at least a couple sentinel compounds, what the data looked like. And again, in the middle screen, um, you can see the, the voltage protocol that is a SIPA protocol. Uh, basically, it's a ramp protocol where you step to a positive voltage and ramp down to back to holding. Um, and then from that, we can get the characteristic HERG um, tail current where you see steady state and then you ultimately see a peak current uh, and then it returns back to um, baseline. And we, we did two things here, or two things that this slide is illustrating. One, the DMSO vehicle control. So for every experiment, we do that. 
um, to make sure that the cells were not seeing any significant rundown or any potential other issues with the vehicle itself. Um, which in the, the lower left-hand corner, you can see that it's, it's very well, um, the inhibition of the peak current is well-maintained, has not changed through multiple editions of vehicle. Uh, in the upper right corner, you can see one compound where we assessed the dose response, and this was in a single cell. Um, you can see the inhibition of the peak current as the concentration increases. And then ultimately, we can generate an IC50 from looking at that tail current and that reduction of, of current as the concentrations increase. Um, also, an, a, another target that we contribute to the consortium is NAV 1.5. And again, the, the protocol is in the middle where this is, again, a SIPA protocol. Um, that all the sites were using. And again, you can see that for the DMSO vehicle control, there's really no effect of vehicle over multiple editions of, of the vehicle over time. Um, and then in the upper right, again, the characteristic um, NAV 1.5 current, um, as you increase, uh, in this case, using tetracaine, there's a reduction in this overall peak current, and then ultimately we can derive an IC50 um, from, from that assessment. And then another one, another target that we looked at is NAV 1.5 late current. And again, using the same protocol um, for the, the prior study, um, we can look at both the ramp and also the test pulse as well. So basically we can look at two, basically the NAV 1.5 test current, but also the late current, which comes later at, during the ramp period. Um, so we can do an assessment of both how, it, uh, how a compound affects peak, but also affects the, the late sodium current as well. The other um, assay that we can look at is late agonist as well. So we can see if a compound actually causes agonist activity on the late current, which is an attribute you, you typically do not want to see in your um, um, uh, your compound. So by again uh, looking at the panels in the left, we can look at a time course of that increase in current, in late current over time, um, and also inhibition as well. So basically by applying ATX2 at a given concentration, we can actually increase the amount of late current um, and basically get an EC50 from that so we know what how much the current can be increased using a, a known um, agonist, we can develop obviously a, a, a curve from that and then we can also test a compound that has um, the ability to inhibit the late current as well and generate an IC50. And we can see how that correlates between both the test pulse and the ramp. And the last assay I'll talk about is CAV 1.2. Um, so for this assay, this is where we, we um, are doing exactly the SIPA. We did a SIPA-like protocol. Um, unfortunately, we found with the SIPA protocol that we saw a, a fair amount of rundown. And by doing some minor tweaks to that protocol, um, as you can see in the left panel, so historically, CAV 1.2 is a notorious channel for running down over time, which then also makes it very difficult to do an assessment of inhibition because you can't necessarily tell the difference between um, actually inhibition of the current or actually uh, run down just over time. Um, so we were able to modify this protocol slightly to be able to reduce that rundown to less than 20%, which then allowed us to get a, a, a at more accurate um, projection of what a compound is doing in terms of inhibition. As you can see in the right panel looking at nifedipine, um, we can get an IC50 generated from that. Um, and then this happens to be two different um, uh, people that operated the machine. So again, there's a, a great robustness of this um, assay to be able to replicate it over time and also between operators as well. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of manuscripts um, that we have contributed to. Again, I, as I mentioned, we had run um, the phase one, phase two compounds for the SIPA initiative. And from that, we, we, did, we did provide that data to the consortium, which ultimately generated two um, publications. Um, and these are highlighted on this slide. And um, both myself and, as David introduced, is also on the first publication, and also Renji, um, who is a, um, our lead scientist um, that it did a, a lot of the work um, that I showed you previously 
um, to contribute to the consortium. So I thought I would give a, a little overview. Um, so if, Previously, I was talking about overexpressed lines that we looked at individual targets. And I think, as I mentioned in my outline, that there's also a way to, to look more at an integrative assessment. So now we have all the channels in one cell type, and we can get an overall viewpoint of what is a compound doing in an actual cardiomyocyte. Um, obviously, you can get cardiomyocytes, but I think a better way to do this, and which was the, this technology was developed about 10 years ago, um, IPS cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, we can basically program cells to ultimately have the genotype and phenotype of a cardiomyocyte, and we can do the assessment of our compounds on those cells. Um, so basically how those cells are generated is taking a skin sample from a, a human and then programming it using different um, genes to drive the, the, these cells to a cardiomyocyte phenotype and genotype. And these cells have been highly characterized in many publications and by the vendors that provide them as well. And again, they, they have all of the, the ion channels that we would expect um, amongst also other GPCRs and things as well. So we can actually get an assessment uh, of a compound even beyond ion channels in itself. And this falls into, as I explained in the SIPA initiative earlier, this, uh, this is a way to be able to do uh, an in vitro effect um, and get an overall um, understanding of what a compound will do in, in an integrative system. And the hope is that from the system, we could translate that ultimately to um, clinic. And again, these are human cells, so they're more physiologic um, than using um, guinea pigs and other cells that have been used in the past. So the, the platform that we use to assess the cardiomyocytes is the MEA, or a multi-electrode array platform. Um, so we use IC, uh, IPS cardiomyocytes, and um, we use iCell squared. Um, that's how we validated our system. And again, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, um, these are physiological relevant cells. So we're going from overexpressed cell, cell lines that are either in HEKs or CHO cells to a more physiological cell. Um, and what you can do from that is measure ultimately a field potential duration. So in the lower left-hand side, you can see an ECG. A field potential is basically a surrogate for, for an ECG because these cells bond, uh, uh, beat spontaneously, so they provide an electrical activity that we don't have to pace or do anything like that. They, they naturally beat, and from that, we can measure that electrical activity. And ultimately, again, as I mentioned, this gives an integrative measurement um, um, of, of uh, your compound's liability. And ultimately, you can translate then your, the inhibitions you may see in the overexpressed lines to what you would ultimately see um, in the electrical activity in these IPS cells. So <clears throat> again, as I mentioned, um, obviously, we can look at uh, different channels in an independent way. Once we add our compound to the, um, the cardiomyocytes, it, it can impact this signal you know, by having inhibition at, at multiple um, different channels. And basically, there's really three, three areas that it could impact the fuel potential, both from a depolarization. So if we're having an effect on sodium channels, typically you would see uh, an effect on depolarization. If we had an effect on calcium channels, um, you would expect to see a change in a plateau phase. And then ultimately, uh, if you have a, a HERG inhibition, that you would see a change in the cardiac repolarization. So that's obviously on compounds that only impact one of those channels. And again, these are three representations of compounds that are relatively specific to each one of those potential uh, morphological changes in the uh, field potential itself. So this is just an overall um, uh, characterization of looking at three different um, compounds, well, actually four different compounds, um, both two calcium channel blockers, a sodium channel blocker, and a HERD blocker. And basically what we can get from the field, pot field potential is four different measurements. Um, one, we can also look at beat periods. So we can also look at the impact of a compound on the, the beat rate of these cells. These cells beat 
between 60 to 80 beats per minute and any impact a compound would have um, on that that uh, beating of these cells you could correlate to having potentially effect on heart rate um, the other thing we can measure is field potential duration so again we can look to see if a compound would ultimately um, cause a q2 prolongation or actually a shortening as well um, so you can basically get both assessments um, from from this assay we can also correct for that so we can correct for heart rate and ultimately get an overall picture um, heart rate to potential any any changes in the field potential duration by using uh, a correction factor and we can also look at spike amplitude so we can see if there's any impact on the, the depolarization at, at any given stage as well so by again looking at compounds that potentially could impact uh, or have sodium inhibition that could translate to potentially a change in spike amplitude so the other ask i'm going to talk about um, a different way to assess these cardiomyocytes is looking at more of a calcium flux assay um, so again, looking at oscillations and changes in calcium entering and um, leaving the cell, we can get an idea of both contra contraction of these cells. So as these cells contract, obviously calcium is moving inward and outward of the cells. Um, and by using calcium dyes, we can measure the the intensity or the fluorescent signal of that change um, and and come up with a uh, a way to assess a compound's liability on impacting um, the 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 contraction of of the ips cells as well that's a little different modality than just looking at electrical activity so this is just a an uh, an overall viewpoint so you can see on the left hand side the the oscillations um, just looking at the cells beating in a natural state um, so we can get a characteristic morphology of of the oscillations um, by measuring the fluorescent intensity as these cells contract so we we can get a, a rate from that um, we can also look at potentially are those oscillations changing in terms of um, either slowing down or or or, or um, increasing over over time so if you look at the lower hand panel so if we add a compound that in in this case it's a her blocker that will actually change the oscillation so actually prolong oscillation so one it impacts rate but it also can impact the time that um, that you can have the the next oscillation so this from this again you can get an assessment of if your compound is ultimately affecting the contraction of these cells and the overall rate of the beating of these cells as well and then again this is just an uh, an overview of looking at three different compounds uh, the potential parameters that you can measure using this system again you can look at overall peak rate and by looking at um, um, different compounds you can get an assessment of what um, potentially your the compounds impact would be on on peak rate um, also the prolongation and then also the peak spacing as well and typically with these assays we will pretreat um, the IPS cells for 30 minutes um, so we feel that that gives a, a enough time for the compound to have its effects and we can compare that to our control data um, and then from that see the difference in what, what the compound at a given dose um, has an impact on these different parameters so in summary um, I just want to reiterate that currently the S7B um, HERG um, mandate by the FDA is HERG centric um, however, as I think I presented on earlier slides and with the SIPA initiative, there are an uh, expanding strategy to be able to de-risk compounds both earlier um, and be able to use in vitro um, type assays to ultimately predict what we would see um, in humans. And that, and that translation is being developed as we tested um, a, a, a bunch of compounds in terms of phase one, phase two that the, from the SIPA initiative, and also continually to test compounds to really refine that, that testing modality. And there are several ways you can do this. Again, I think HERG is still something that is screened um, relatively early in drug discovery. 
And as, as you progress down the development of a drug um, and become to a point of lead optimization, that's where I think the, the SIP strata really kicks in because now you want to test a multitude of ion channels. Um, and again, at, at Eurofins, we have several different um, um, assays. So through for, for the high throughput, um, obviously you can use HERG binding, but we can also use Q-patch. Uh, we can do functional as well. Um, and then as you go down the triage, um, once you get to lead observation, then probably that would kick in where you'd want to look at um, a PCIPA core um, type of assay where, again, you're looking at HERG, calcium, and sodium. And then ultimately, prior to in vivo, you'd want to do a full panel, so that would have also an additional um, set of, of uh, ion channels um, to give an overall holistic um, assessment of your compounds. But ultimately, you want to see um, what that inhibition means. And that's where I think the IPS cells show their strength is now you can look at an integrative assessment um, by looking at potentially what your compound is going to do to the ECG in itself by looking at a field potential and or looking at calcium oscillations to see if there's any impact potentially on rate or contractility. Um, the other thing I would mention with the flipper assay is that's also a good assay to maybe do earlier on to get an assessment um, because it is a relatively high throughput assay. You, you could do a larger amount of compounds earlier on to see if you have any potential liabilities. And in conclusion, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present some of this data and some of the strategy for the SIPA initiative. Um, and all the contact information um, is below if you would like to contact us or have particular questions. Um, this was just an overall um, uh, assessment of what we have done, but we also have very detailed protocols and um, we can, we're more than happy to discuss any of your projects. Um, each project can, is, is unique and we want to make sure that we support your project any way that we can to, to drive it forward and ultimately get it on market. And with that, I will conclude and turn it over to David. Thank you very much, Brian, for addressing this very interesting topic. Uh, we have a couple questions that's very frequently uh, asked by our clients, and uh, I'm going to ask here. So the first question is, uh, what's the currently recommended testing strategies under the SIPA initiative? So for the SIPA initiative, um, as I had shown in earlier slides, is their recommendation is to do seven individual overexpressed ion channel targets, um, which goes from HERG all the way to KV4.3. And then once you get that inhibition information, you can plug that into an in silico model that will give you a prediction potentially of what you would see in an integrative model. And then ultimately you would want to go into the IPS um, C cells um, to either using an MEA or a flipper or there's some other um, assays as well to get an integrative assessment so you can see the translation of what potentially you would see in the overexpressed lines to the MEA and the ultimate goal is to be able to translate that to human. Um, so the SIPA basically has really three components, testing multiple ion channels, the in silico model, and also doing an integrative in vitro assessment. Thank you, Bri. Uh, our next question is, uh, what is the proposed course of action if a test compounds have polypharmacology on multiple ion channels uh, that was tested uh, on the cardiac ion channel target list? Great question. Thank you, David. Um, so again, from that, <clears throat> we can get the individual inhibitions, but the really the, what we want to know is what the translation is. And again, the first step is you could go into an in silico model to get a potential prediction, but ultimately you really need to put that into an integrative model to get an overall assessment of what your potential liability is. Um, again, just because you have a HERG inhibition number and that it may be concerning, as I mentioned earlier in the slides, um, by doing an integrative assessment will really give you an overall picture of what the potential risk is of having that polypharmacology in a more physiological cell um, a, 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 a cardiomyocyte. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, our next question is, uh, for the automated patch clamp assay platforms to check client compounds multi-ion channel effects, um, what are your Eurofins discoveries, typical assay protocol, study workflow, 
and what will be the final deliverables and turnaround time? Great question. So basically, once we receive your compound, um, we make stock solutions that are 300x the top concentration we would test. All this is done in glass. We do, we maintain the DMSO concentrations for all your con for all the the drug concentrations, um, and then from that. Um, the Q-patch, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, is a single hole, so it is like doing a manual patch experiment, and all this is done in glass. Um, we will run your compounds, typically in replicates of two at each given concentration, and from that, depending on how many concentrations you test, um, we can generate an estimated IC50. And typically, depending on what assay you're running, we do have two flavors of HERG. One where you, we have a five-day expedited turnaround time. So if you really need your data quickly, um, we can provide that in, in, in five days or less. Um, our standard assays are 15 days um, for HERG and also all the other um, ion channels that are in the cardiac panel. Um, and so we can basically address your needs, but we're also willing to work with you if, if you really need um, fast turnaround time. Um, we, we can also do expedited on some of the other channels as well. Thank you, Brian, for the answer, and thanks, th thanks again for the presentation today. Uh, that concludes our webinar session today. On behalf of Eurofence Discovery, we would like to thank you all for joining us today. Please submit your inquiries and questions to the email provided at the end of the presentation. Thank you again for your time and interest. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you very much.